Welcome back to GraphQL FM, everyone. This is our last episode before the holidays. Um, much needed holidays for everyone, I think. Um, as usual, I'm joined uh, by my co-host, Tony Geta. How are you doing, Tony? Hey, hey, uh, doing well, doing well. Excited for, uh, excited for break, excited for this chat too. Um, how you doing, Mark? I'm doing great, super excited about this chat too. Um, this week, we've got uh, Tejas Shikare. Um, who's joining us uh, from Netflix. Tejas, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. I've uh, watched some of your previous podcasts and uh, the conversations have been really fun and impressive. Uh, so I'm super excited to be here to talk about Netflix and GraphQL Federation. Yeah, I'm super excited too. And I, I feel like Tejas, we see each other uh, by passing at some conferences. We're on some panels, uh, but I'm excited to talking to you. Uh, not in person, but in a one-to-one -one context with uh, with Tony. So, super excited. Do you want to start by introducing yourself, uh, what your role is at Netflix, what got you to kind of GraphQL in general? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so I started at Netflix. Uh, you know, uh, firstly, I'm, I'm Tejas. Uh, I've been a software engineer for almost uh, ten years uh, since I graduated from college, and uh, been worked at several different companies, but. Most recently, I've been at Netflix for about three years. And, you know, right after I started, we kind of started exploring GraphQL. Uh, and this was more specifically for the, the studio ecosystem. Uh, you know, Netflix is not a stranger to, to graph APIs in general. There has been Falcor that has been around for almost a de decade now that uh, since it started, maybe maybe a little under the de decade, but but, you know, that's how Netflix API is bu built on top of. And GraphQL is very similar to that. And, you know, uh, and Studio Ecosystem was fairly new at the time. It was kind of, think of it like a bunch of startups within Netflix uh, trying to help the, the, the movie production scale. And, you know, think about like making Stranger Things, right? From, from the time you actually pitch the idea to get it, you know, to play on Netflix, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. There's hundreds of workflows and uh, different tools. And they were kind of built like kind of in a, their own silo, but a lot of the data was kind of connected uh, under the hood. And there were like some core entities and things like that. And, and having GraphQL was great as a, as a, you know, a single conceptual API to mod domain model some of the data, at least earlier. And then now we're thinking about how can we have, you know, UIs use that API to, to, to power, because there's about, I think at this, counting there's at least 60 applications for all these different sorts of things. And they're growing rapidly every day because the movie industry itself was like very paper uh, driven. And now it's like completely getting, you know, a lot of technologies built around it. So, so that's where we kind of started our GraphQL effort. Uh, and we started building a single GraphQL API. So, you know, just take a graph and it was supposed to serve like some of the core entities, uh, you know, mostly movie, which is like the central entity uh, at Netflix and everything else revolves around it, like what talent works in movie, uh, what production this movie is part of, et cetera, and so far. So we, we started with like two or three like very basic entities and people loved it. Like people loved consuming from it. And, and the API was like self kind of documenting almost. So people started using it. And at this point, I remember it was really small. And in, in within like a month or two, we had so many users that, that dif 30 different clients at least that started using it. And they asked, oh, can we have this data on there? And can we have more? And then we started adding. And it was just like three of us, you know, kind of managing this GraphQL API, which, which was growing so rapidly that within months, we, we were doing more operations than actually implementing the GraphQL API. And that's how we kind of uh, got started with GraphQL. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's, uh, that's a great story for GraphQL, especially for a company that, as you said, like had something uh, not necessarily similar, but something in its place before. Um, it, was that a monolithic GraphQL API at that time, or were you already starting to distribute the schema? No, yeah, it was absolutely a, a monolith API because our, our goals were pretty small at the time. You know, we, we just wanted to serve these like core entities. Think of, we were always thinking of it like from a very backend perspective, we wanted an aggregation layer. And GraphQL was great at doing that, you know, but we didn't know the nuances of what GraphQL was built for. And and so we started using it, and it worked. It worked really well. So so we didn't really, you know, uh, think about distribution at all until like three or four months into the architecture when it's the number of consumers grew and the number of data in it grew as well. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah, it, it it reminds me of um. There's a there's a blog post Netflix published that that must be like at least five years old about um that issue where like every client needs uh, a different representation and they have this I forget what it's called but I think like server side adapters or something where you had like a bit of groovy code uh, uh, yeah. kind of like building client specific payloads were you were you using that stuff before so so not on the, the okay. studio side I think that's still kind of live on the on the uh, uh, on the, the the consumer side and think of those as more like uh, BFF, but kind of managed yeah. for you so that because there are four main UIs um, and, uh, you know, the TV UI, iOS, Android and, and uh, the web app and and each of them had kind of like a different payload. So the idea of Groovy was there's one conceptual API, file core API that sat under it, but uh, the Groovy allowed you to like massage the payload uh, and, and, you know, UI developers could, could uh, deploy code over there and you know, kind of uh, go from there. So it was more like a managed BFF because you are, on the studio side, it was a little bit different. Uh, there were BFFs and people were building them. And actually we had like pockets of GraphQL BFFs already. So before even hmm. we started using GraphQL, people were already using GraphQL. So it's been, it was being used uh, everywhere directly, but we didn't really use the groovy stuff on the, on the studio I side. See. We just dove right yeah. into GraphQL. Yeah. You mentioned that um, you had a bunch of clients uh, on the studio side uh, consuming your GraphQL monolith. Were those like uh, internal uh, production side apps? Uh, yeah, so both uh, internal and some of them were also external for, uh, so not necessarily like outside of Netflix, but Netflix works with a lot of like production vendors and things like that. So people who are like actually making the movie. Yeah. So, so a lot of the tools were internal and then a lot of other tools were also uh, we're looking at around, kind of think of like an enterprise application suite, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but for like movie making. Yeah, nice. So you recently published two amazing blog posts on um, Netflix moving to a federated model uh, for GraphQL. And I think before we dive into the specifics here, can you tell us kind of like what happened? Because you had a GraphQL API. It was used by a lot of clients. Uh, clients loved it. Um, what was kind yeah. of like the, the moment or the signs that having one monolithic API was not enough anymore? Yeah, for sure. Uh, firstly, I think I would say that the, the schema health, uh, I think, was starting to deteriorate a little bit, uh, you know, because it was like three of us engineers building the schema and the resolvers. So we were kind of like ad hoc making decisions on how to expose that. and. And it inevitably it started looking a little bit like the 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 backend data model because we were kind of backend engineers, uh, and which was not great. But people were people still liked it. But that was one reason. And then second reason was, uh, I would say the the amount of time we spent on support uh, was was very high because now if you're maintaining a, a monolith GraphQL API, the for every question, even if it's like downstream, it comes to you first. And then, you know, you have to do some work to, to at least route it. Uh, you know, we can build tooling around it. We, we, we started, but, but ultimately it was taking up a lot of bandwidth. And we basically, the on-call week was just doing on-call stuff, like answering questions and, and, you know, if something went wrong, figuring out what's going on, working with the downstream team to make sure to get it fixed so that the API was back up and running. So those were like kind of the, the primary bottlenecks. And then, you know, our, our colleagues on the consumer API side actually are, are running an API like this, which is actually massive. It has thousands of types in there. It's a Falcor API. And they were running into the same bottlenecks. And, you know, they, but they've built so much tooling around it uh, at this point so that it's, you know, it's still productionized. So moving from away from it, it's very difficult. But, but, and then the last reason I would say is every time you want to add a new feature, you have to first implement in the backend service and then implement in the GraphQL API. So that is also yet another extra step before the UI can actually start using that feature. So, uh, so as a result, we teamed up. Actually, we, we we kind of merged with the other consumer API team, and we we had one of the engineers join us, and we we started working. Three of us started working on this uh, GraphQL federation because it was it looked pretty promising at the time. The architecture itself, we we sort of came up. Uh, um, you know, we were thinking of how can we distribute this uh, this uh, monolith API 
uh, how can we distribute the ownership of, of the schema? Because everybody loved the, the conceptual monolith. Uh, so we started uh, brainstorming some ideas and we came up with a high level architecture. We didn't have any implementation details. So the idea was to have this, this GraphQL gateway uh, that would kind of have uh, domain graph services under it. And these domain graph services would be fully spec compliant GraphQL services that, that you would run. And there was a, some way to kind of uh, uh, have this type live across uh, both these services because that's really what. And then just shortly after that, the timing was so perfect that that federation came out and and that and then you know we we prototype with and then the rest is kind of history from there. Yeah, so this is this is really interesting. So you you without knowing about what the community was building, identified kind of like that that problem in a solution that ended up being very very close to what Apollo were doing with federations. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, to their credit, they, they had thought about the problem way more, I think way longer. We had just started yeah. thinking about it. Uh, and, you know, actually my coworker, uh, Steven, actually implemented sort of this prototype on the on the consumer graph as well that 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 did some kind, he, I think he called it illogical orchestration or something like that. <laughs> and and uh, so he the people were already thinking about this, like, how do we, you know, do this? And then graph, uh, Apollo obviously had thought about this problem for like, longer period of time and had developed like an open source solution for, and, and that was a great, you know, sort of building block for, for what we are trying to achieve. That makes a ton of sense. I think one thing you mentioned is that you, um, the team building the gateway uh, initially was also the team implementing all these, uh, all these features basically, and those the kind of like parts of the domain. So, uh, as you said, that must be like quite a bottleneck eventually and hard, hard to support. Did you, did you ever consider kind of, how can I, can I say this, like make changes to how that's done? Like maybe keeping one monolithic gateway, but having teams like building tooling for teams to collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. Actually that was one of, one of the, the uh, highly, you know, one of the things we definitely considered uh, kind of having a single GraphQL schema and a server. But kind of uh, di distributing the the resolvers resolver code into like little kind of uh, their own repositories mm -hmm. that people would maintain, uh, and 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 I think it, it, it was definitely a good approach. I think we just had so many learnings from the 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 Falcor side of things that that once you actually do that, there's still all these problems around running everything in a single server. So you're running a lot of code that is changing every day in a single server. So let's say if you write like a, a memory leak in one of the, the resolver modules, and that can affect basically all the other uh, services. Right. The whole reason to move to microservices was to get that extra level of isolation. So we knew that in the back of our minds, and that's where you know building tooling definitely was a path. And I think it would have worked. I, I don't think there was no reason why it wouldn't have worked. Uh, it's just there was already all these other problems that we had previously solved and identified that we wanted to go with the, with the, the, the distributed approach. Yeah, makes total sense. So you've uh, you've written a couple. There's a couple of blog articles about the. Um, I'm trying to pull them up here about the uh, infrastructure with some nice graphs. So uh, I'm looking at it now. It's got um, the GraphQL gateway at the top, and pointing into that is like this. Uh, uh, schema registry service that that you've built out. Yeah. And then. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, finish your finish your uh, question. Uh, in uh, just a high level overview, so you uh, you have those two components, and then under the the gateway are the individual uh, domain graph services, what you called them, uh, that are like uh, movie and um, other domains, uh, and then those also talk to their registry uh, schema registry service. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, uh, uh, before I, I, you know, the the schema registry is not really needed, uh, technically okay. speaking, uh, to to make federation work. Uh, so technically, you can just introspect uh, all the schemas individually from because these are fully spec compliant GraphQL services. Each of those domain graph services. Uh, so so technically, the the schema registry is not required. Uh, but if you if you start thinking about the operational overhead of automatically introspecting the schemas and then merging them on the fly in the gateway, that creates like a lot of fragility in the in the system. 
And I think this, the goal of the schema registry is to add a workflow on top of that. So, so when you change schemas, uh, you know, you have like kind of a, a, a snapshot in time of every single state that each DGS can possibly be in. Mm -hmm. And there's a workflow. So you, there's no way to have like push a backward incompatible schema by mistake to, mm -hmm. to the gateway. Mm -hmm. However, your DGS doesn't really know about the movie DGS or production DGS. What if I, uh, you know, make a backwards incompatible change in my DGS and and then and then when I introspect that schema directly from the gateway, that's going to cause a potential composition failure. And you can build tooling around that to say, hey, you know, don't use that. Use the previous one that you had. But it's very brittle in that in that mm -hmm. sense. So that's that's the, the main goal of the schema registry is to add that stateful component that creates that extra workflow on top. Is that workflow um, a runtime workflow? Uh, do you kind of need to deploy your indiv individual DGS before knowing these things, or is that a kind of a build time workflow? Can I can I have this check? Uh, do people know if they're going to be making a a bad change before kind of like sending their they're part of the schema in production. Yeah. So actually, as part of the, the developer tool experience, we kind of built uh, some of this workflow into pipelines for, for DGS uh, developers. So we kind of uh, built it into the, into the, so there's a DGS framework that actually does, you know, makes it easy to implement the, the GraphQL services. And then along with that, in that build, there's some Gradle commands that you can use to push the schema. And then also, uh, along with that, there is there is a automated pipeline that that does it for your continuous integration. So some teams actually uh, opt into the pipeline directly, so their code deploys and then it pushes the schema. Uh, however, you know some teams also can push the schema, but the there is a little bit of no. You know you have to know what you're doing if you're pushing the schema manually because let's say if you push the schema to the schema registry, then the gateway is going to have those new fields. And mm -hmm. for example, if that field is non-nullable. And you know you haven't pushed the code out to the to the to the DGS. Then what's going to happen is that entire you know the parent is going to be set right. uh, to null. Ah. So, so you have to be really careful with with with. Uh, but we have tried to make it easy for the DGS developers to like not think about that too much unless they want to like custom push some schema change without having to push the code. Uh, but yeah, interesting. So the way you've just described it uh, uh, seems like somebody can push a schema before, if everything is nullable, for example, it's safe to push a schema uh, that's not implemented exactly. yet. Um, and maybe that opens doors to a lot of cool things, right? Like it could be initially kind of a mock um, and, and then you can bring the yep. implementation later. That's awesome, yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's actually really nice uh, in, in, in terms of, so as long as you know what you're doing, and this is the part where we, find very hard to kind of convey to, to the developers because it, GraphQL itself is quite complicated, right? Like you have to learn all those things. And and in this scenario, a lot of teams have to learn GraphQL first before they can then contribute. That was like one of the, the big bets as well. So I, I feel like at this point we have to touch on nullability then. Is that with the, yeah. with the best practice uh, for you be to have most things nullable at, at this point because of these? these things or not necessarily? Uh, I think the idea is, you know, when in doubt, uh, we tell DGS developers make it make it notable, but there are use cases uh, to, to have non nulls and, and, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to make a decision for, for, the, you know, for whatever it might make sense. But generally, you know, even if you do, if you take federation out, nullable fields are really nice because kind of GraphQL was designed for it pretty much. So you can get, uh, possibility of partial results uh, when you make your fields nullable. Uh, also, non-null fields are hard to evolve. Like you can't make them nullable in the future. That's almost a backwards yeah. compatible change. So, so generally, even if you're doing federated or non-federated GraphQL, I think the idea is you know you make it uh, nullable. And and federation actually is very interesting. Uh, uh, it's even more makes more sense to to have nullable fields because so think about uh, a federated type, right? It's Let's say we have a federated type movie, and in movie we have a title, which actually comes from title service and or title DGS. Let's let's make this up, and mm -hmm. then some image which comes from like uh, image DGS. And in that scenario, what federation actually does is it's going to look at the parent field where you're getting that movie from, and it's going to try and fetch as many fields as possible from that particular DGS first, 
and then use that uh, joined uh, lookup call to look up the, the image field. Now, if you had image set to null or to, to non-null, then, then even if you found the title, uh, you would get a response that sets the movie object to null because image was set to null. Yeah. So actually, in case of federation, we actually almost, uh, uh, unless you have a very good reason to have fields in a federated type be non-null, make them nullable. So that's, uh, that's another use. However, you know, our client developers, they love non-nulls because they, you know, you don't have to check. Like that's yeah. the, the argument uh, we hear. So, so what we did actually, there was this one really cool blog post where, which talked about this query directive at non-null. So we kind of implemented that in the gateway. And the idea is with the query directive, the, the client can decide what they want uh, uh, to be non-null so that they can skip the null check. So in this case, like if there's a view where it can't be rendered without the image object, then you can set the image to act non-null in that particular query. Oh, interesting. But as far as the server is concerned, hmm. is 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 is, a, is nullable. So that's actually worked pretty well. Few of our UI developers are using that. And then I think primary keys are okay to be non-nullable because you know if you can't find one, you probably want to set the, the parent object to to null. And then input types are another one we say is okay if 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 you have. Uh, no, no. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Input types are kind of backwards because if uh, if you require yeah. them, you can unrequire them later, and you're fine. But you can't make some an optional required. Uh, yeah, I think they 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 have the exact opposite behavior right. of the output type because the, the it's decided by the client, right? And then output type is decided by the server. Yeah. Um, these domain uh, graph services. Uh, movie production talent do they uh do they know about each other like do they you say like or you mentioned that like like a, a movie will have a list of talent included um yeah is that... so so sorry finish your question I, I was just wondering if you could uh like we could just dig into that a little bit um yeah so as as far as the, the graph your level they don't know about each other they're they're purely mm -hmm. separate uh, GraphQL schemas that are standalone and, and work uh, fully spec compliant. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, when you have microservices, uh, you know you 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 have to have a foreign key to the other microservices. So let's say if you have a movie service and a talent service, right? Uh, there has to be a movie talent relationship, and that that relationship is often taken over by a certain team. And in that in this case, uh, the talent team owns the movie talent relationship. So it mm -hmm. makes sense uh, for them to actually extend the movie object and implement uh, any talent-related fields in the in the movie object. So, so at the schema level, they do kind of know about each other because that's where the foreign key is stored. Mm -hmm. But as far as the, the architecture is concerned, uh, those two services don't have to know at all about each other how they work. Yeah, which makes sense really you said it earlier like it really at least brings you more towards the decentralized side of things um and since you use a microservice oriented architecture you don't want graphql to bring back everything as one one big gateway and one of my one of my fears i guess is if i always wonder if we're truly decentralized or centralized with graphql even with federation um do you is i guess do you have any techniques to ensure like one of your federated domain services can't take down everything is nullable the best way to do that where if there's an error in one service it will only affect uh these fields or is there other stuff we can do yeah i mean ultimately if if the serve the domain graph service that actually goes down is the first field in your root in right. your query then that whole query is host right so it all depends on where so there is there's like a stroke of luck there. Like if 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 the field that you're requesting is in is in is is like a later service, then then if it goes down, it's gonna it's not really gonna affect. You know, right. you're still gonna get that partial response. But if the if it's the first one, then you then you're pretty much host because data is gonna be set to null. So really, you know, it's query by query basis uh, how the impact of one service going down affects the entire ecosystem. Uh, 
but really, you know, that could be a problem whether you use GraphQL or not, right? Like, yeah. like let's say if you if you need to if you just use REST APIs with microservices and you need to get this first piece of data so that you can query. So I, I need to get all the talent IDs so that I can get the movie IDs they're working on. Like if I'm trying to build like an IMDb kind of yeah. thing, uh, like I can't really get the movie IDs until I know what the talent is. So, so that's really not like a GraphQL problem. It's probably just that microservice going down problem. And, and the way to, you know, obviously we have ways to make it more resilient itself. Uh, but yeah, I think that kind of failure is, is mainly uh, kind of gauged on query by query basis. That's a really good point. Cause like even, even if you're using REST or like if everything is super decentralized from the client's perspective, if the first query fails and you can't do anything anymore, it's still, the client yeah. still can't do anything. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think one thing um, we wanted to go into as well is just the whole query planning side of things. And that's sure. kind of a, a huge can of worms, but how do you, how do you ensure the best performance basically for a query that's going to span multiple services? Is there something super smart or? Actually, there isn't. Uh, it's actually very similar. Uh, so if you think about the resolvers, mm -hmm. uh, it's actually very similar to how the query plan works, except instead of resolver is being, uh, is, is a resolver per field. Uh, query plan have this thing called fetches per query, subquery, and and ultimately it's still a bread first search, uh, similar to 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 what the resolvers uh, do. So really the performance will be almost equal to if you if you had a monolith uh, with the resolvers. Uh, there might be some cases where you can optimize performance in the resolver because it's all running in a single server. Uh, they're fairly rare scenarios. For example. Uh, Let's say if I have two fields uh, that have side by side resolvers, and 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 one of them takes we know it takes super long compared to the other one, uh, you can actually start f and that field has other child fields that you can start fetching with. Uh, you can't really do that. Uh, I think t technically Apollo is working on a solution for that, but. But that's like a super edge case. Like in most edge case, most scenarios, uh, you're kind of going to do this breakfast. So, so if I have this top level uh, root field that is in DGS one, and you know, and it has some children. So whatever children I can fetch, I'm going to try to fetch as many as possible optimistically uh, in that one one request. So add it, make it a subquery out of that, and then. Uh, and then any other children that, that require uh, federating to one of their DGS, you would use the, the entities resolver because that's where uh, the type gets extended and the, the fields are uh, implemented. I don't know if that's super clear because it's it's really a hard concept to explain in, in, in words. And I tried to do yeah. like in the blog post, I tried to do like with an example. Yeah, no, but it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, I, I guess one thing sometimes I have, um, so, most people use some something like data loader to avoid kind of like, um, well, to do two things like cache things you already have and batch things you want with federation. Um, does the batching still happen on kind of the thing that it wants to fetch or? Yeah, so it does actually. So, so let's say, you know, your, your, your previous subquery, uh, you know, you're federating like hundred entities, the entities resolver, like if you think of it, like the easiest way to, uh, think about it as the node uh, version of yep. the relay. So think of requesting like nodes uh, 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 with with all the IDs you need in one shot, and then uh, and then that's kind of batching the part of the query. And then under the hood, you know, you still have to resolve every field and implement data loaders for it. So so the DGSs are actually implementing the field level uh, resolvers and data loaders, uh, but when we join the, the when we merge the two query plan fetches, uh, those are actually merged uh, in parallel. Interesting. And actually, we 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 have a thing where we should probably we don't set a limit on how many objects we can send to the entity resolver. Right now, we should probably uh, we haven't run into that use case where you can actually do like five thousand, ten thousand. Right. I don't know what will happen, but because that payload becomes super massive. Uh, 
Uh, but but we should probably like batch that even further uh, with a parallel request or something like that. Yeah, yeah, we we ran into the same thing at Twitch where when we started off with GraphQL, we were really concerned about doing the most optimal thing, and similar to your result, we found um, it's often optimal enough to just breath like do a, a tree traversal, and um, the cases where a uh, good optimization would be much better are, are actually very rare uh and just the it's so much more robust to do just to treat your first because it's easier to fit in your head and you don't have to special case certain things and uh yeah, yeah i mean it's, with, the, with the current performance you know we we ha it really hasn't affected um uh, any of our existing queries that were there and you know people haven't really complained about we haven't made any optimizations to the query plan uh that that people have complained about where you know we we found something that that was completely unacceptable yeah i imagine there probably are some workloads where you do need the always the most optimum query plan but um i think in a microservice architecture it's so complicated there's so many like different parts and uh, I, I think a lot of people add caching to their data stores to make the, certain things faster and there's a lot of tricks you can do to Kind of just keep it simple and keeping it simple also keeps it more, uh, I don't know, resilient or robust. Yeah. So, so for, uh, for, 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 from a caching perspective, you know, uh, we, we also do data loaders. Uh, I think data loader is the, the, the main kind of way to cache something for that request lifecycle. Mm -hmm. Uh, some teams are, are you referring to caching in the sense of uh like fallback fa failure kind of um in the most general sense possible just <laughs> it's too it's hard to get too specific because uh just in general like keeping things in memory to return them faster yeah in in whatever case yeah yeah so so for for at least for the, the studio ecosystem uh we value consistency a lot yeah, so yeah. so the idea is we we don't want to over cache things because mm -hmm. what if they change, it's going to screw up someone's workflow. Yeah. So the idea is data loader is great for request lifecycle. And then we do a, a bunch of client caching, uh, which is actually f fairly good because you, you, you know, once you have the state loaded up, the page loaded up, then you can only fetch things that you need. Uh, and then, and then, you know, uh, having something like the object identification, global object identification makes it easy to do that. Uh, so those are the two approaches, but but definitely for for our consumer API, uh, we really value availability of the service more than you know it's okay if if certain fields don't show up, mm -hmm. and you know we can fall back to like a so for example we actually personalize each image on of what you see in the Netflix app, uh, for whatever reason if if you're not able to there, there's actually always a fallback image that is like the, the the standard image that you'll always get, and that's that's in a cache so that's uh, it reduces the consistency uh, uh, a little bit, but but uh, we haven't really had to do that on, on yeah. the studio side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have have kind of a similar history with caching too. It's hard to. There's some use cases for for which like a cache is absolutely essential uh, for other services where you can't tolerate that much stale data or you just don't want to risk like uh, serving stale data. So, um, so same thing at, at GitHub, we use data load. The batching part of, of data loader is a bit more useful uh, than any caching. And if, if we're caching, it's within a single request and not for, not for time uh, or anything like that. Um, uh, keeping on with the, the query plan thing, what I'm curious about is, um, so things go well generally, um, but I'm sure in like some a percent of requests, sometimes you get something weird, some weird way to fetch data. Um, what's the best way to kind of identify like bad query plans if they happen? Um, it, can you see into that that black box very well? Yeah, actually. So so you know, uh, if there is a bad query plan that happens, it's going to cause a lot of problems. There's you know. It, uh, when when a bad query plan is created, you can't execute that bad query plan, yeah. right? So there's going to be a sorts of exceptions or error thrown. Uh, uh, 
one one scenario where it can happen actually is uh, if you if you push a, a, a schema uh, field and and to the to the registry, but that field does not exist on the on the on the DGS, then you're essentially requesting a field that that doesn't exist at all. Uh, that can potentially cause you know it's technically not uh, the query plans logics problem. But it's you know just because the, the schema was checked in in the wrong way, but the, but there is a lot of you know we, we we detect it at the gateway level when when the exception gets thrown, and to be to be surprisingly we haven't actually had any scenarios. We have seen uh, bad query plans with some of the fragments early in the day when we didn't have as many okay. users with fragment cases, and we actually fix them. And we what we do is we take these we we use this. Um, Kind of uh, behavior-driven testing model, so you can actually take the, the the schema for each DGS, and you know you take the actual use case that uh, triggered the error for those two services, and then write a query on top of that that actually failed, and then uh, we expect what 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 is the query plan for that, and 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 we have about I would say like over two hundred to three hundred different cases among all the different types, so we haven't really run into that issue, particularly uh, in in the last six months we have been live in production. In the early days, yes, with the when the fragments and stuff were still a little bit yeah. shaky, but, 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 but. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Somebody in chat, I think, asked uh, what DGS stands for, and that's Domain Graph Service, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's just a, a GraphQL service. You know, Apollo calls it federated service. We kind of wanted to have a little bit more uh, our API to be, be domain driven, and that's why we call it a domain graph service. So, in in your blog post, you you have this. Um, it looks like you're using distributed tracing um, a lot uh, with GraphQL, and it looks it looks like you have really nice detail into what happens during the execution of a of a GraphQL request. Can you kind of talk a bit about how you implemented that? Is that all kind of Netflix stuff, or is there some open source stuff in there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so so some of the stuff actually already existed. For instance, uh, in, the, in the blog post, I have an Edgar trace, uh, which is actually kind of, it shows you like a request lifecycle of a particular request and what all microservices it goes through. That is part of, uh, you know, that that was built by one of the telemetry teams at Netflix. And, and it actually integrates with the, the platform features. Uh, so if you run micro, if you run a microservice at Netflix using one of those platform features, you automatically kind of can plug into that pretty easily with a, with a property and you know start uh, sending trace data. And if you, if you have threading, then you have to make sure that it gets properly propagated to your threads. But for the most part, that part was pretty trivial to, to integrate with. And then, well, it also uses under the hood our uh, uh, Zipkin. I think that's an open source uh, tracing. Uh, and there's, I think there's a library that we use, Brave, on top of that. And basically, to, to Zipkin, you know, you can create. Uh, I think the global spans are automatically created again by the platform infrastructure. But you know, the developers have the power to create local spans uh, within within a, a request. Request span, so you get a really nice level of detail into like how your request is flowing and where the error happened, so that based on that you can go and uh, ping the right person. That has been the biggest win because because previously when we were maintaining the the GraphQL API, everybody would come to us, our Slack channel, and ask what's going on here. <laughs> uh, we deep link the Slack channel from from you know if you know what DGS the problem is in, uh, there's a there's a there's a nice view for DGSs and people can. Oh, I see this. It's red in this DGS, and you know this exception is thrown in this particular span. Uh, that's what the the issue is. So I'm going to click on their Slack channel from this UI, and then go talk to them what the problem is. So we have that has been the biggest win of, of distributed tracing, is to not field every single question. And then the second thing that it, it really is nice is, is it gives you a latency view. So you can debug performance problems. Like if you haven't used a data loader, you can you know shame people into using data loaders. And uh, <laughs> you know it, it, it. And one of what what one of what our uh, teams did was was as the DGS framework, which we have a separate team. Uh, it's going to be open source soon, and it's built on top of Spring Boot. So it's it's just GraphQL Java, but 
a lot of nice stuff on top of Spring Boot, actually automatically create these local spans. So, Ooh, so nice. in, within the data loader and within the, the data fetcher. So you, you, developers don't even have to do that. Nice. So that it's it's been a, a really big win. Uh, I think integrating with that, we can't take really any credit for it because we just integrated with it. You know, it was as easy as calling an API and just uh, getting everything together. But but it's it's been really um, game changing for us. Yeah, I was just reading in, yeah. in one of your posts, I think, uh, on that on that framework. I think it's a different team that built that, but that uh, for the DGS themselves, like the framework. Uh, everybody uses seems just amazing that seems like such a critical thing to have if you opt for a federation kind of a a common way to deal with all those cross-cutting concerns that a federated service should have right yeah exactly i think uh, so we actually work very closely uh with that team uh uh paul and kavita are, and, and david david was building the, their ui on top of that so you can see what's happening with, with the states uh, yeah, it's been it's been really the the key driver to adoption because if we told people to learn GraphQL and then start building GraphQL services from scratch with metrics and uh, I think that we struggled with that when we started right like we had to figure out yeah. how instrumentation worked how you know how how where we wanted to log metrics how consistent error handling worked. DGS framework just takes care of that you just throw an exception from your resolver and it automatically sets the right uh, response in the address array. That's awesome. Yeah. That kind of tooling is so key. I'm, I'm really curious now, uh, and maybe that's, uh, I'm really curious about what the dev experience looks like for a new, let's say a completely new service. Let's say there wasn't an actor service and uh, the, the yeah. actors team wants to expose something in the GraphQL API. Um, where do they start? Is, is that fully automated? Like, can you get a scaffold using that framework like really easily? What does that look like? Absolutely. Absolutely, you can actually, you know, you just have to do, uh, we have this tool called Newt in it, uh, and it sets up a microservice with all the deployment pipelines nice. and everything. So they do that. In their Gradle file, all they have to add is the DGS starter, which is a Spring Boot starter. And, you know, as soon as they they, they uh, pull those dependencies down, everything is the endpoint from everything is set up. And all they can start doing actually is defining the schema and start writing functions that they can annotate with with uh, with with uh, the spring annotations that the team created so like for a data fetcher you would just say add dgs data and then you would provide the parent type and the field mm -hmm. and then everything will automatically get wired up and they can also start using data loaders and there's like an example code that they can go look at copy and paste it in there and they're good to go awesome experience yeah that's just so cool to hear yeah that's i feel like if you, when you have a setup like this, like onboarding to GraphQL isn't isn't such a, a big deal for uh, for a team. Yeah. Uh, just uh, the whole framework is there uh, to help you. I assume you've got um, as far as like schema linting and everything. Is that more the schema registry's job, or is there something closer to the, the framework <coughs> code? Yeah. So so uh, today it happens in, in most of it happens in the schema registry. So, you know, you get to validate your schema upfront, but we, we have aspirations to kind of do that, you know, expose that library in the framework. So you can even do it in IntelliJ, for mm -hmm. instance, where the developer is actually, uh, building that schema. So, uh, yeah. So imagine, you know, making a schema change and validating with the rest of the DGSs that it's actually a valid schema change across the entire ecosystem mm -hmm. versus just locally uh, within your DGS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> same. Yeah, that tooling is uh, so key, especially when you're doing micro, I guess just in microservices, just when you have a more complicated system, you need to have more sophisticated ways of uh, doing common things, just the basic stuff, logging metrics, uh, uh, timeouts, uh, retries, that kind of stuff. Uh, so key. Uh, and it's actually, awesome that you can- if you guys want to check it out, the, the, uh, Paul and Kavita who worked on this, they actually did a talk at QCon Plus about using developer experience to uh, 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 accelerate GraphQL adoption at Netflix. So definitely check it out. Yeah, 
That sounds like a great talk. Um, if we can find a link, I'll definitely link that in the, the show notes. I was just watching that a bit before the show. Yeah, I'll share the link okay. with you after. Yeah, I, maybe it's not released yet. To you know, I think QCon does its kind of uh, standard release, but it might be coming out soon. So. Yep. So um, one thing I wanted to ask as well uh, about this uh, this whole federation thing is I think I asked something similar earlier about like did you consider like keeping the monolith and distributing uh, I want to dig deeper into this because I think uh, kind of like everything is a trade off and I think there's something you mentioned in the post about one of Netflix value is I forget what it is maybe you can help me it's like context over something yeah context over control right and that that just seemed like to resonate so much with me because um it's also something we deal with a lot and also something we believe in where we don't we want to be like empowering engineers to write apis and not necessarily just like be an api team that just writes every api right um and one question i always have is you mentioned schema health and schema quality a lot um so you want to empower users, you have these frameworks and everything, but what about kind of like general best practices, reviews? Are you part of any like kind of review board or is that really like full trust for for engineering team? Um, yeah, you, you know, we, we have uh, we have another one at Netflix, which is a which is freedom and responsibility. Uh, we don't want it to be, be freedom from responsibility. So so really, I think I think. Uh, you know, it's it's been it's been actually that's been one of the most challenging parts of, of this of this whole project is how do you how do you get how do you maintain schema health because you know uh, APIs uh, you know requirements inevitably change and you need to uh, adapt with them so you need a, a good deprecation workflow in place which which that was not the hard part but really how do you even start with the schema design process and we have actually quite a few things we have. Uh, for the for the studio side, we have a studio data architect whose full time job is is kind of thinking about what this domain looks mm. like for all of the ecosystem. And you know, there is other things that are small and mutually exclusive. You know, they can go in with less uh, uh, with less uh, kind of uh, rigor. But you know, there are certain things that are in very core and should be treated. You know, it's like making sure you don't deploy like a bad build uh, for your most important service, right? You, you want to you wanna have that extra level of l rigor for s those those types. And so we do have a schema working group uh, that meets uh, regularly and, and, you know, topics are brought up there and this, we, we discuss them. Uh, we have a schema review group as well. Uh, and these are all like part-time volunteers uh, across the organization who are passionate about GraphQL and, you know, really care about the schema health, not just within our team. And, and those, those have definitely, uh, kind of, uh, kind of, you know, given us a good start, but I think this, this is like one of the key areas for like innovation and, you know, thinking like, how can we make this better? And I think both a human touch and tooling can be involved. For mm -hmm. example, uh, for federated types, right? Technically, only the only the field on a type is owned by a domain graph service, but but you yep. you you know there is actually conceptually still a still an entity owner like there's still some service that's like I'm defining the primary key for this mm -hmm. particular type, and I should be no I should know about when people are extending my type. So we're thinking about how can we have like a, a authorization system around that where if you try to extend like mm. a core type, uh, you you get to take permission. And you know, have the review with that with with that particular domain owner. So so, those are some of the things that we're thinking for 2021. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the key challenges, and it's a it's a it's an area ripe for innovation. Yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, we have something uh, that's quite similar to what you described, um, kind of like a service owner on each type um, and on each endpoint. Um, we haven't started using that for reviews, though. That'd be interesting, kind of a code owner kind of approach where if you touch one of these types, like mm -hmm. there's, although we might already have that actually. Um, so that, that works. Uh, I think that works great. Um, Tony, I, I don't know if I've ever asked you, like, do you, do you have any kind of like core review group for the schema or is it more of like on, on a team per team basis? Yeah, so uh, we have a, a monolithic code base with 
monolith uh, uh, or monolithic gateway uh, where all the schema lives, and the uh, all the schema reviews go through my team. So we kind of try to uh, I don't know. It's like tending a garden, I guess. You kind of just uh, <laughs> you know clip it here, clip it there. You know, uh, try to set some good guidelines, um, which is one way to do it. Uh, ownership is is a definitely a challenge. Um, I think type extensions. Uh, this is something we're we're going to explore also in 2021. Uh, using type extensions and, and uh, code owners in GitHub to kind of assign use like a clear ownership mechanism uh, to pull in those people uh, into reviews. But yeah, I, th I think like no matter the approach, like ownership in an API is is always tricky and uh, it changes over time. Uh, things get reorged. People leave. People come. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Uh, Tejas, do you? So you mentioned like the working groups. Uh, I think it's super interesting. Is there a culture of kind of a, a bit of design first as far as the API goes? Um, or yeah, are people usually excited to talk about the design before even starting their service, before starting their schema? Uh, I think we are shooting. It's, it's not always the case. I mean, at this point, we have about 70 DGSs live already, Right. 15 prod. Uh, so, so I don't think it happens for all the cases, but but yeah, I think we are trying to, you know, at least uh, be aware of all the new schemas that are going to be coming up, and if possible, you know, if they if they interact with some of the core areas, also get reviewed uh, for for. And on top of that, there's a lot of like we had a technical writer uh, who, who who wrote a lot of the manual. Sorry, was there like a loss of audio for a second there? I think I clicked something on on the window and it made a, like a, a emoji pop up. I'm sorry. No oh, worries. No yeah, we we had a we had a lot of, we had a technical writer that wrote a bunch of like awesome best practices and and uh, and including the the docs itself that that actually helped people on board into this architecture. So we have a plan to like how do you what are the steps you need to take to to onboard because the the people part the tooling is pretty good. But the people part mm -hmm. still needs to be kind of well documented. Yep. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, we've been uh, we've been uh, check out the blog posts we have we've uh, we've talked about today. I think those are pretty cool. Uh, I think Apollo. If you're interested in federation, I think Apollo is doing a pretty. You know, they're leading the charge. So definitely check them out as well. And. And then, you know, look out for DGS framework being open source. It should be any day now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Netflix.com slash jobs. Uh, there's a lot of positions out there. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in this kind of GraphQL stuff or, you know, distributed systems, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting positions. Uh, I think, uh, I think we could all just congratulate ourselves for making it through uh, 2020. I know it's not quite the end yet, but, uh, it's been, it's been quite the year. So, <laughs> uh, uh, and thank you for, uh, taking the time to talk with us. This has been uh, a really good talk. It's super interesting seeing how, uh, Netflix approaches this, uh, on the studio side and kind of how you've thought through all these, all of these different problems. It's super interesting. All right. Yeah, thank you. And I actually want to thank you guys for you know doing this. This is super cool. Uh, I've uh, I've checked out some of the few previous episodes, and it's been very enlightening for some of the the, the, the issues and problems and architectures that you that you've. So if anybody's watching this, I definitely encourage you to keep checking out their their show. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone.